Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about Euclid Space Telescope. So let's dive right into it. So what is this Euclid? Well, I'm reasonably sure if you've paid attention to mathematics, you must have known this Greek mathematician Euclid. Basically, we talk about Euclidean geometry. That's what we are talking about. Uh, basically, it's an honorary name. And this puppy can see from visible to near infrared. Now, be very mindful. Visible means almost like Hubble Space Telescope. Near infrared, a bit more capable than Hubble, but less capable than JWST. JWST can go deep infrared. Basically, very cool. That's why it requires ludicrously large amount of cooling. This does not go that deep. Now, here's the deal. Many times whenever you are running a space agency, you have budget categories, meaning some things are priority budgets. For example, anything that is like flagship or related to human missions, basically ISS. So those things, you need money, blank check. Take it and go. Don't ask about it. Flagship project like JWST, over cost over, don't ask about it. But not every project can be done that way because again, you are not military project and not to mention nobody has infinite money. So there are classes. Now this puppy is from medium class. What does that mean? M class. It simply means there is a bottle uh, cap, basically budget cap of 500 million euros. Meaning if you cross that puppy, done, cancelled, go home. Bye bye. It does not have the luxury of like JWST where it was like one. If it started at 500 million, then they revised it to 1 billion and then it took 10 billion. That's not going to happen with this sort of thing. So uh, the people working on this, they are working on absolute constraint. They do not experiment with new technology because they are like, dude, this is something that I can take from Chef, build a mission that fits inside this cap. So they will aim for 400 million and then finish it in 500. So. That's a very unique kind of error. And be mindful, it's not like, oh, NASA always has cost over and only on their proprietary, uh, proprietary, I'm saying, priority missions or like basically anything related to human or flagships. Everything else are cut down. Like there are many missions, even NASA does that are like, dude, if you go about this budget, bye bye. There are many low budget systems. So this is low budget kind of thing. That's why you're not seeing so much high priority, even though what it's doing, it's kind of interesting. So what's its aim? So it's basically focusing on dark energy and dark matter. Now be very mindful. We know there are two things, dark energy and dark matter. But uh, even scientists are like, dude, we should not have called this. We should have called this Hululu and Jingalala. Uh, because we genuinely don't know what it is. It's like uh, many times we say the word graviton, basically a particle that is carrying gravity. Because we named it, many times people ask that it's like, hey, what is graviton made of? It's like, dude, we don't know. It was just a hypothetical. It's like, you know, find X. Now people are thinking X is the name. Uh, so that's what happened with us. We have no idea. We just know there is something, uh, something that's behaving. So you will see this sort of images uh, thrown around. We started to see this as early as Hubble, like with definitive proofs, like no, no, there's some aberration. No, no, it's absolute. It's happening. It's happening everywhere. So this telescope is specifically targeting to study one thing that is distance and redshift relationship basically how they are making love to each other how far are you how redshifted you have to now how the heck we know the data is redshifted or is the spectrum signature because everything has a signature uh, we know star signature again we have sun to verify our results let's say the signature is like this we know like hydrogen in star this sort of signature will happen but what happens if it shifts a little bit we'll call it redshift what it pulls here we call it blue shift so we are looking for redshift yes there are one galaxy that is coming towards us that has blue shift that's how we know that is coming towards us others have red shifting now how much red shifting is there that's the easiest way to uh, calibrate distance and red shifting we have to marry these two data precisely right now what we have is good data is like we have some idea now we want to make it like absolute data so it's like around 2000 kilometer to no 2320 Seven kilometer. That's what we want to do. And you will really hear uh, this data point is like redshift or till two. What does that mean? That simply means seeing back till 10 billion years. Now be mindful, this number is smaller than what JWST can do because again, JWST goes into deep infrared. And basically, it's trying to understand the effect of these energies, basically dark energies and dark matter into the expanding universe. Basically, what's the mathematical ratio? Is it going faster? How much faster? We have like sloppy data at this point in time. We want precise data. Gravitational lensing is the key factor that is paying attention to. So using all that data stream where it's like, okay, I'm observing a large area and I'm trying to extract what is the relationship between distance, redshifting and what vector that it applies to expanding universe. So what tools is going to use? Well, it has a 1.2 meter primary mirror and that's the primary reason why this uh, is so cheap. You can see that mirror is not that huge. It's like there are many home te amateur telescopes that have that kind of mirror. It's not that it's like college university level mirror. Of course, ground to absolutely high precision, but that's the reason why the cost is not so high. Then it has uh, this puppy that is VIS or visible sensor. Now, one thing you have to understand, we always use CMOS on this earth. You have to understand many times, even better technology gets surpassed by 
you know cheaper technology like CMOS is inferior than CCD then why the heck we don't use CCD we used to back in the days cinema cam digital cameras use CDD, CCD uh, back in the days basically broadcast camera always used to use CCD but uh, CMOS became cheaper and cheaper and because it became cheaper it became mass produced once it became mass produced more R&D money went into it over time it took over CCD but if you are working on a uh, scientific instrument environment where like money is no object give me the best possible technology CCD will always be used that's why majority of the uh, basically whenever you are talking about uh, instruments that are going into space majority of the time they will be CCD not CMOS now this puppy have six by six of it a boatload that's why I said very wide angle and each sensor like each uh, is almost like a medium uh, medium thing basically full frame kind of size 4k by 4k that's 24k by 24k it's seriously large amount of visual data it's gonna capture in one click so to say and uh, it's all he's gonna do is apply lossless compression to it be mindful there are compression algorithms that allows you to shrink the size without destroying the data but uh, it's not that efficient basically uh, if you're taking a raw file you can shrink it to 1.5 mb uh, jpeg but generally raw file is preferred but in raw file if you have high enough compute horsepower you can compress the raw let's say the raw compression is like 35 megabytes can be compressed to let's say 30 or maybe even 20 but you can't get multiple x but you can send compress it and send it and decompress it without loss so this is going to compress the data and send it raw data will be sent it will not process it it does not have the ability to process it it only has the ability to compress and voila send it to us then there is the main puppy that is near infrared spectrophotometer this puppy now this puppy is a bit smaller but it's uh, 900 uh, nanometers to 2000 nanometer and uh, if you pay attention to basically uh, JWST this number goes much longer and that's the whole point it JWST is cool to almost absolute zero this only is cool to minus 138 degrees Celsius that is minus 200 plus so this goes cold but not that cold benefit low cost now because again the data from this directly sent to earth uh, you are talking about 850 gigabits per day this is some serious amount of data that is going to be transferred here like some serious amount of data and that's why it's the wide field and the idea is that we're going to have the raw file here we're going to use supercomputers to crunch that puppy and again you must have noticed if you are uh, familiar with cameras you must be familiar that many people like to save the raw because this raw from even an old camera can be reprocessed with better algorithms and get better result out of it. Even, I'm talking old, like 10 years old or even 20 years old, if you have the raw data. Basically, if you have the data that was made by the sensor without any processor algorithm crunch, you're going to have some good results. So that's why they were NASA or uh, ESA, they just want to collect the data and then crunch it here. Six, uh, let's say the mission will last for six years. So at the end of the lifespan they will get the data they will have much better computer by then on earth much better algorithms by then on earth and then enjoy so that's why directly raw data just it barely has the capacity to store almost uh, one day of data it's like a 300 gb data storage capacity is there it's like very little and this is the filter wheel uh, that is going to do to uh, selectively uh, image spec part of the spectrum so what's the mission? Well, it's going to exactly same location as JWST. Now, if you are like, wouldn't they crash into each other? One thing I have to say, many times we humans talk about like, you know, uh, there is so much junk in space. Is there a junk in space? Absolutely. Is there dangerous? Undeniably. But you have to understand, volumes are a bit difficult to understand. How many fishes are in the ocean? Billions? Easily? Now, here's the deal. Why the heck they don't end up bumping into each other? Because sea volume is so exponential. It's like comparing a bucket of water to a grain of salt. That's the volume difference between ocean and fish. Complete, complete every fish, that's how much the volume ratio. Same goes for here, basically. Is there a donut? Let's say the donut orbit is there on Lagrange point two. How much volume is there versus how much volume the these two observatories are occupying? That's like nothing. Like you have to deliberately work hard to hit each other. So it can be done. Of course, if you have bad calculation and like orbits are not properly maintained, of course, over time you could come too close to each other or just make love to each other. But generally that will not happen. It's not like, a, oh, we are going to crowded places. Like if you do your math right, do some orbital correction once in a while, you're good, you're safe, you're stable. And this puppy should last for six years expected lifespan. If it does better, longer than that, undeniably awesome. Be mindful, it does not have any fancy cooling requirement like JWST. So it should inherently last much longer and it can over its lifetime can image 15,000 degrees square. That's a like wide field, ludicrously wide field, almost a third of sky. And that's why I specified, we are noticing gravitational lensing, but uh, all our telescopes, be it Hubble, be it JWST, they are like precise. 
they are like a pinhole camera uh, if you have any wa watched any movies with snipers you must have noticed there is a sniper and there is a spotter this puppy is a spotter it's not uh, very like you know narrow point i know what i'm looking at it's like i'm observing the whole thing basically how we use our eyes to observe things it's like oh there is a bird then you pull out your binoculars and you're like okay i'm now looking at it so this is the eye cut you know spotting part of things so it's supposed to observe around 10 billion astronomical sources now like wait a minute how the heck we know even that much yeah we do we do not have name for all these stars at this point it's just number data string number data for all the sources but we have we have like no these are not uh, noise data from sensors like we know these are stars so it's gonna observe like that's why i said wide field this puppy is wide and the benefit of that wide uh, coverage is that it's gonna be a target spotter for JWST, extremely large uh, European telescope, uh, large telescope, square kilometer if it finds something that is should be interesting in radio frequency, it will send the data to square kilometer. Again, this not, the people operating this are like, hey, uh, square kilometer, look into this direction, you may find something interesting. So that's the whole point, that's the mission statement. So what about how we gonna launch this? Well, it's supposed to be launched on Soyuz ST-P variant, basically with giant payload fairing on 2023. Unfortunately, Putin went lol and uh, Russia invasion of Ukraine changed the plans. So now the data is sent to uh, basically SpaceX. SpaceX is responsible for it and target is around Q3 of 2023. Now, will it launch at that time? Most likely, yes, unless there is a fault with the rocket or there is a, like, you know, uh, some weather events or things of that nature, it should launch. There is sh There should not be, unless something extreme happens, there should not be any scenario where it should cross to 2024. Yes, they have to move everything from that uh, payload adapter to this one, but it should be doable. And not to mention, it's going on testing right now and things are working just fine. And that's why I specified, there is no new technology. It's just like, oh, we have CCD, how about we put many CCDs? That's it. There is nothing new. There is nothing fancy. Again, the main mirror is tiny. We have amateur telescopes that are bigger than that. But again, the aspect is enjoy the benefit of uh, no atmosphere. And specifically for infrared, it does matter. The same reason why we put JWST above there is simply because we cannot do infrared observation on Earth. Atmosphere itself glows. The same thing applies here. Again, if that goes in very deep, but again, very tiny area of patch of sky it can study. This one is like, I got this. I'm going to be your eyes in the air, air as they say. So it's going to be launched and I'm excited about it. It's a subtle mission, but I'm excited about it. I'm especially excited about the fact that they had a budget and they finished in the budget. <gasps> So this was my presentation on Euclid Space Telescope. Hopefully you have liked it, learned from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends. That will help me a lot. If you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment. Please leave a comment because I do try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free. And as always, thanks for watching.